It is my great, great honor and privilege and pleasure to bring up uh, someone who is not listed on the program uh, unfolding this afternoon for us, but who will begin our event. And that is the inspired, the vulnerable, the creative, courageous and inspiring Zoe Leonard. Hi, everybody. Hi, people. Um, whoa. Um, wow, it's a beautiful, beautiful tribe of people here. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, first, I want to just thank everyone um, at the High Line for inviting me to install this work and for organizing every aspect of the project and the event. Um, Melanie Kress especially, um, but also Robert Hammond, Cecilia Alemani, Hyatt Mannix, Jordan Banke, Gonzalo Casals, and Adrian Cotin, who did the soapbox responses. And also thank you so much to Timo Kapiler, Sarah Rosenblum, and Kate Abrams from Hauser & Wirth. Um, my heartfelt and wholehearted thanks to all the readers and performers who traveled from so many different places like Geneva and North Dakota to be here today. Um, and thank you everyone. I want you to all be my president. Um, so uh, I wrote this text 24 years ago it's been circulating a lot lately, which has been a bit of a dichotomy for me. On the one hand, I'm thrilled and gratified that something I made more than 20 years ago is still considered relevant. At the same time, I'm utterly horrified and sad that something I wrote more than two decades ago still has such relevance. This is not a text I would write today. I don't think about identity politics in the same way. That is, I don't think that a specific set of identifiers or specific demographic markers necessarily leads to a particular political position. I also think and feel that the Obamas changed something irrevocably. I don't agree with everything Obama has done while in office, I don't agree with all of his policies and positions, but Barack Obama and Michelle Obama elevated the role of the presidency, right? They brought dignity, they brought grace, they brought intelligence and patience to their roles. And perhaps most importantly, they acknowledge complexity. Complex issues aren't answered with one-liners. Instead, issues have been unpacked in long discursive speeches, complex consideration of tangled and complicated problems. This kind of attention changes things. It has prompted a more nuanced and grounded conversation about race and gender, about class and civil life, about energy and climate. It's made me think about what civil life is, what civic life is. In this context, it feels possible to understand myself as a citizen of this country, despite whatever differences I may have. And this is because I think there seems to be room for difference, for discussion. So in some ways, I was surprised when this text from 1992 resurfaced and began to circulate the way it has, why these words matter to people. When I was invited to install this work here on the High Line, my fear was that it would be misunderstood as a call to vote for a third party. It's not. I'm with her. Right. 
Um, I think that what's going on in the text is both a real call and a metaphoric one. Yes, I want a real person in that office, someone intelligent, experienced, and compassionate. But this text also asks for something beyond any one person. It's a question of power. Who has it? Who gets a voice? Why are some of us marginalized while others are ushered in? This is a structural question. This is a conceptual question. This is a real life question. How do we choose to govern ourselves? I think about the gap from 1992 to today, all we've gained and all the ground we've lost. We all have our ideas and our lists. Is it two steps forward and one step back? Or one step forward and two steps back? I'm not sure. And yet, I suppose I'm here today because I am still taken by the idea that government can not only be of the people and for the people, but most importantly, by the people. And that means us, you and me, all of us here today, right now. So from 1992 to 2016, I'm gonna just go ahead and read this. Um, could I actually get a sip of water? Sorry, a little dry mouth. Excuse me. So, I want a dyke for president. I want a person with AIDS for president, and I want a fag for vice president, and I want someone with no health insurance, and I want someone who grew up in a place where the earth is so saturated with toxic waste that they didn't have a choice about getting leukemia. I want a president that had an abortion at 16, and I want a candidate who isn't the lesser of two evils. And I want a president who lost their last lover to AIDS, who still sees that in their eyes every time they lay down to rest, who held their lover in their arms and knew they were dying. I want a president with no air conditioning, a president who stood online at the clinic, at the DMV, at the welfare office, and has been unemployed and laid off and sexually harassed and gay bashed and deported. I want someone who spent the night in the tombs and had a cross burned on their lawn and survived rape. I want someone who's been in love and been hurt, who respects sex, who's made mistakes and learned from them. I want a black woman for president. I want someone with bad teeth and an attitude. I want someone who has eaten that nasty hospital food, someone who cross-dresses and has done drugs and been in therapy. I want someone who's committed civil disobedience. And I want to know why this is impossible. I want to know why we started learning somewhere down the line that a president is always a clown, always a John and never a hooker, always a boss and never a worker always a liar, always a thief, and never caught. <laughs>